the presentation of anarchism, anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Theft on the Ground Floor by Danny Spinoza. Our story starts in the late summer of 2019, when the English department at my university was undergoing a significant set of renovations. This was a big deal for us, and a surprise, because of how rarely the contemporary university spends its funding on the humanities, let alone literature departments. The renovation involved not only a change to a new updated building, but also the installation of a massive wall-to-wall work of collaborative visual poetry I completed with two of my closest friends. The work was solicited and paid for, and everything was feeling pretty glorious for a few weeks. And then imagine my surprise when I, an adjunct faculty member, was told I was being assigned a shared office. An office that I would share with only two other adjunct professors, one of whom only taught online and therefore never used the space. Yeah, Bernice and I had an office. And get this, a corner office. I bought a coffee maker and some office supplies. Bernice brought in a few course books and a bag of chocolates and we both felt a little bit seen and accommodated by our employer. Now ours is a department like many others that relies quite heavily on adjunct labor, but I should add that ours is a labor union like few others with active and strategic leadership and a long history of long strikes that has been dedicated for years to trying to add security to the university's vast precariat. So, in 2019, Bernice and I felt cozy in our shared office. And then, one day in January of 2020, I arrived in my office to find that there were several boxes of a tenure-track professor's books and other course materials dropped into our space. I emailed the department to see what the boxes were and when they'd be moved, but Bernice and I were told that the boxes were for a professor serving an administrative term and thus needed an office for when her term was over. That office, her office, was our office. And she had been moved in while we were still there. Over the course of the next few months, these boxes were very slowly, at the approximate rate of half a box per week, unpacked gradually closing out the space that was once shared between Bernice and I and revealing clearly the precariat's necessary transients in campus spaces, and so too the necessary transients of campus for the precariat. The way the story of Bernice in my office ends, we all know well. Quite suddenly, as the winter 2020 term neared to a close, campus was shut down in Ontario's state of emergency. Only two weeks after I taught Agamben State of Exception to the incredible post-colonial lit class I was teaching. And what remained of Bernice and my stay in the office was trapped there. Bernice's chocolates left on the shelf, my best teacher ever mug beside them. I still haven't been able to go back to campus to retrieve these items. What happened to Bernice and my office reveals a good deal about labor relations in the university and the general tendency towards precarious labor. But it also reveals something significant about the precariat's relationship to the physical space of the campus. I'd like to start thinking now about the university campus, a place that has history, permanence, a clear relationship with its community and its environment, 
and a marketed and marketable sense of belonging as a shifting signifier that gradually becomes a non-place for the adjunct faculty that continues to carry out much of its labor. I am thus theorizing campus as a non-place, determined by the individual's economic relationship to it. And I am wondering how the shift to the remote campus that we've all undergone fits into this conversation. When I say non-place today, I am thinking about the non-place as theorized by Marc Auger. Auger's non-place is a transient place, a place that lacks distinct grounding in history, in the surrounding geography, and to a sense of selfhood and belonging central to that place. And I'm thinking primarily about how Joy Bertling theorizes Auger's non-place in a 2018 article about the role of place and Auger's non-place in education. In this article, Bertling observes that we are now completely and fully within Auger's supermodernity. And that, according to Bertling, quote, our modern global economy produces environments of uniformity and ensures experiences of abstraction, dislocation, and virtuality. Now, obviously, Bertling could not have considered or expected what would come two years after the publication of this essay that would cement or solidify, and here I resent these solid physical metaphors and their placiness, that abstraction, that dislocation, that virtuality, into a thing called remote learning. As I write now towards the end of an entire year of remote teaching, in the midst of this pandemic, all while working as adjunct faculty at three institutions, it has become all the more clear that the adjunct's relationship to the campus of remote teaching is looming and historical like an absented Atlantis. Please note, this is not a diatribe against online courses. In one of my other lives, I'm a digital humanist with a strong belief in the increased accessibility and new potentials of literacy afforded by digital pedagogy. I'm asking us to look instead at the ways that this year of remote learning furthers the already clear dislocation of the adjunct laborer from campus and the production of a new non-place of campus for the vast precariat of the academy writ large. The relationship between campus and its laborers shifts dramatically depending on how the worker's labor is valued and compensated by the university. And so, the campus for the adjunct can be defined as a non-place, a space lacking meaningful relations with other spaces, historical presence, or a concern with identity, a space divorced from anthropological place. The physical, geographical space of campus is not those things. For Bertling, the non-place represents a decentering of space, a moving away from cities, dwelling places and dwelling in places, and even embodied experiences, and is thus a movement towards capitalist and often technologically mediated spaces of, quote, circulation, consumption, and communication. Bertling's is an obvious interpretation. And while I enjoy it, it also ne is necessarily a way of divorcing Auger's work from some of the more important elements of the non-place. That is, Auger's meaning of the non-place is, must be, much more grounded in the literally transient, the literal bare life of the most marginalized of our world. And, of course, I don't mean to appropriate or distract from the very real and significantly more serious conditions of the kind of non-places O'Shea identifies or how they are expanded upon in the work of scholars like Sarah Sharma. Instead, I would like to point, as Tim Gregory does in his theorizations of the contemporary middle-class office as a non-place, to the ways that the precariat reveals these larger structures, particularly in terms of the invisibility of the middle-class precariat that the university has continued to produce on a massive scale. 
For Gregory, the shift towards occasional or contract-based labor across industries has, quote, produced a state of exception office and the precariat employee. It's no coincidence, Gregory tells us, that the rise of the precariat workforce mirrors the rise of non-place offices because, quote, the precariat employment is defined by the very same characteristics as non-place architecture, that is, temporariness and transience, empty signifiers and cheap veneers, open spaces with radically increased connectivity. In the act of remote teaching, there is a well-documented feeling of isolation among students and I want to argue that because the adjunct faculty is further dislocated from an already ephemeral campus, a campus that was always already not theirs, the result is an increased and insolvable isolation of the precarious worker. Indeed, as Auger argues, isolating the individual and enforcing a universal average makes, quote, the face and voice of solitude all the more baffling by the fact that it echoes millions of others. For Gregory, this is a push and pull tension of the crucial invisibility by means of total visibility of the precarious laborer. He writes that, quote, the precariat worker is neither mourned nor martyred, the invisibility of a worker's identity is ensured by the total visibility of the worker's individuality. And further that, quote, the precarious life is maintained by nostalgia for a total community whose residue is reborn in the ironic symbolic qualities of equality and openness in a non-place office. Ironic symbolic qualities, like the temporary residence in a corner office the superficial adorning of the department's walls with the laborer's art and achievements. In my department, the undergraduate essay prizes were just announced, and almost all but one award was won by a student nominated by an adjunct faculty member, including one from me and one from Bernice. The one that wasn't was a very recent contract to tenure track conversion. This is at once indicative of the symbolic qualities of equality and openness, and also of the greater tendency of adjunct faculty to do these above and beyond things for their students, to devote additional time and resources to a place that asks almost nothing of their labor. In Sarah Sharma's eloquent words, quote, all the non-place asks of you is to plug in and pass through. As it has done so much in other aspects of our lives, this pandemic renders the campus a non-place for some. It reveals the levels to which the precariat needed those scarce resources that campus did offer, and the levels to which our experience and our visibility in those places was only ever transient. And because of this, I argue that the adjunct faculty member must insist on their space in this non-place, must continue the political act of coffee makers and chocolates and post-it notes as the boxes of academia continue to unpack around them. Adjunct faculty must stake claim to the space of the academy, must subvert the temporariness of the campus and its insistence on their transient. And as such, adjunct faculty must occupy a space like the subversive intellectual as theorized by Stefano Harney and Fred Moten in the Undercommons. Fundamentally, Harney and Moten's idea of the Undercommons requires that on some level, the campus is a place, both physical and theoretical, under which the radical scholar might, quote, go with hands full into the underground of the university, into the undercommons. This will be regarded as theft, as a criminal act, and it is at the same time the only possible act. But the theft of the adjunct faculty is not underground, must be on the main floor. 
What is and where is the theft when the university demands your labor but will not hire you? When their relationship to your labor is already a kind of theft. That theft is a theft of space, an insistence on occupying what will not be given over. And in this world of the remote campus, that kind of occupation is difficult to conceive of. One thing I do that may or may not help is sit as a contract faculty member on our faculty council, ensuring precarity's presence in these spaces, however symbolic. And in several of our recent council meetings, we've been visited by the dean of the faculty who keeps showing us further renovations scheduled for campus buildings and plans for the new satellite campus. The drawings are vibrant and beautiful, and the places seem fantastical and far away. As they call for a motion from the floor to extend the meeting by 15 minutes, I imagine how many offices these theoretical buildings will hold and dream of squatting in them, making coffee and refusing to leave. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.